Ben, there's been a lot of talk about a housing bubble, particularly you know from the Fed, from all sorts of, of uh, uh, different places. Can you give us your view as to whether or not there is a housing bubble out there? Well, unquestionably, housing prices are up quite a bit. I think it's important to note that uh, fundamentals are also very strong. We've got a, a growing economy, uh, jobs, incomes. We've got very low mortgage rates. Uh, we've got uh, demographics uh, supporting uh, housing uh, growth. We've got uh, restricted supply in some places. So it's certainly understandable that prices would go up, would go up some. Um, I, I don't know whether prices are exactly where they should be, but I, I think it's uh, fair to say that um, much of what's happened is supported by the strength of the economy. Tell me, what is the worst case scenario? So we have so many economists coming on our air and saying, oh, this is a bubble and it's going to burst and this is going to be a real issue for the economy. Some say it could even cause a recession at some point. What is the worst case scenario if, in fact, we were to see prices come down substantially across the country? Well, I, I guess I don't buy your premise. It's a pretty unlikely possibility. We've never had a decline in house prices on a nationwide, a nationwide basis. So what I think is more likely is that house prices will slow, maybe stabilize, might slow consumption spending a bit. I don't think it's going to drive the economy too far from its full employment path, though. Um, I'm hopeful that, and I'm confident, in fact, that the uh, bank regulators will, will pay close attention to the kinds of loans that are being made, making sure that underwriting is done right. Um, but I, I do think that this is mostly a localized problem and not something that's going to affect the national economy. So we expect moderate growth going forward. We believe that if the housing uh, sector begins to stabilize um, and if some of the inventory corrections that are still going on in manufacturing uh, begin to be completed, that there's a reasonable possibility that we'll see some strengthening of the economy sometime during the middle of the year. Our assessment is that uh, there's not much indication at this point that subprime mortgage issues have spread into uh, the broader mortgage market, which still seems to be healthy, um, and the lending uh, side of that still seems to be healthy. The global economy continues to be strong. Supported by solid economic growth abroad, U.S. exports should expand further in coming quarters. Overall, the U.S. economy appears likely to expand at a moderate pace over the second half of 2007, with growth then strengthening a bit in 2008 to a rate close to the economy's underlying trend. I am entirely sympathetic to the efforts of the Fed. You know, this is a very hard time, and, but you should know that uh, I'm biased because before he was demoted, um, Ben Bernanke was the chairman of the Princeton Economics Department. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> okay. Um, how does all this end? That's the, that's the interesting question. First question is, you know, is this going to mean a recession? And let me say with great certainty, I don't know. Um, and nobody knows. Peter Schiff, he's president of Euro Pacific Capital. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Peter, I want to start with you. Although there are more and more people saying that the U.S. economy will be in a recession next year, it is still a minority position. Why do you think that a recession is coming? Just how bad is it going to be? I think it's going to be pretty bad, and whether it starts in 07 or 08, I think, is immaterial. And I also think it's going to last not just for quarters, but for years. See, the basic problem with the U.S. economy is we have too much uh, consumption and, and borrowing and not enough production and savings. And what's going to happen is the American consumer is basically going to stop consuming and start rebuilding his savings, especially when he sees his home equity evaporate. And when you have the economy 70 percent consumption, you can't address those imbalances without a recession. You know, rather than the recession being resisted, it should really be embraced because the disease is all this debt finance consumption. Huh. The cure is that we stop consuming and start saving and producing again, and that's a recession. And sometimes, you know, medicine tastes bad, but you've got to swallow it. Art Laffer, you hear him? He says the consumer is going to slow down in order to rebuild the savings. And you know that two-thirds of the American economy is driven by the consumer. Do you believe that? No, I don't believe any of it whatsoever, Michelle. Excuse me. But, you know, what he's saying is that savings is way down in this country, but wealth has risen dramatically. The United States economy has never been better shape. There is no tax increase coming in the next couple of years. Monetary policy is spectacular. We have freer trade than ever before. And not only that, but there are no incomes policies things here. I, I think Peter is just totally off base, and I don't think it's going to be... I mean, I, I just don't know where...
where he's getting his stuff. The well, savings one of us rate is, one of us is off base, but it's, it's definitely not me. I mean, it's not wealth that's increased in the last few years. We haven't increased our productive capacity. All that's increased is the paper values of our stocks in real estate. But that's not real wealth, no more than the NASDAQ was wealth. When, when you see the stock market come down and the real estate bubble burst, all that phony wealth is going to evaporate. And all well, that's going to be left is all the debt that we accumulated to foreigners. Peter, uh, I'm going to take a that. bet with you on this one. I'll, I'll bet you a penny on this one that if you'll sign a letter saying that if you're wrong, you'll, you'll sign a letter that you were wrong to me in this. But you're just way off base. There is nothing out there that tells us we're going to have a nice slowdown, but it's not going to be a All right, crash. let me ask you this. I'll bet you a lot more than a penny. Big question. Will homes be worth more or less in 2007? Tom, what do you think? You're going to see uh, prices go up about 10%. Here's why. Because you're going to come into a regular, normal market, and a regular, normal market, that's about what kind of appreciation you get. The is home prices up 10% <laughs> in the coming year. Peter, what do you say? Well, today's home prices are completely unsustainable. They were bid up to these artificial heights by a combination of temporarily low adjustable rate mortgage payments, by a complete you know, absence of any lending standards, and by speculative buying. And what's going to happen in 2007 is a lot of these artificially low arm payments are going to re be reset upward. You're going to start to see uh, both the government and the lenders <coughs> reimposing lending standards and tightening up on credit. And you're going to see a lot of the speculative buyers turn into sellers. And these sky-high real estate prices are going to come crashing back down to earth. I, I, first of all, I have no idea what Peter Schiff is talking about. I agree with Tom. I think they're going to be up, probably up to about 10 percent. What artificial lending standard are you talking about? What's word to Peter? Go Most first. of the profits that people have in real estate are going to vanish, just like the profits in the, in the, in the dot coms <laughs> in 1999-2000. It's a fantasy. People can't sell their house. The inventories are exploding all over the country. Houses are on the market for six months. A Year, there's no bidders. So, uh, the price right. is going to fall through the floor. You guys I, are deluding yourself. We heard it. Think what's we heard it loud and clear from all of our panelists. We thank you very much. Subprime is tiny. Subprime is a tiny, tiny it, blip. It's not <laughs> tiny, and again, it's not just subprime. It's the entire mortgage market, right? Every. All right. Well, Tracy, you're, you're disagreeing. You're simply it's wrong. Well, you're point. simply wrong about that. No, I'm not. Um, we have That's a more efficient true. economy. We have yes. Even we don't even have a more efficient a, economy. Yes, we, we have a bubble economy. We're borrowing from abroad to consume. That's not efficiency. What do you think gold is saying? Well, you know, first of all, you just described the U.S. market as being bulletproof, and I think gold is telling us that it's about to get shot full of holes. I also, I think, I, I might uh, just uh, maybe take a little issue with uh, the other uh, yeah. guest here. I mean, in that, I mean, the whole concept of the, the, this U.S. economy is teetering on recession. Um, you know, with all due respect, I think is is, is, is absurd. Uh, it's not because, absurd. Uh, it, it's completely absurd well, because the, the stock market. The excuse me, sir. Let me let me finish. Um, I think that uh, stock market, generally speaking, does not give false positives uh, or, or false well, negatives on recession. Where were you in 1999? In 2000, the stock market doesn't give false signals. Well, of course, the it does. Well, how, how are the consumers served by having the value of their money, the value of their wages, and their savings diminished? I don't think that that has any impact. The Fed doesn't have any impact on that at all. I of mean, course, it does. Those who aren't familiar with you, this has been your prediction for how many decades now? Well, not not decades, but it's certainly been my my prediction for the last seven or eight years, and mm. I've been dead on right. You you have? Sure. Look what's happened since 2000. So I think as more and more people are starting to see that Wall Street is conning them, you know, and hey, if these guys can be so wrong about Enron, so wrong about WorldCom, so wrong about, wrong about Cisco or any of these companies that were so heavily touted, why can't they be wrong about the whole thing, about, their, about what they're saying about the economy, about what they're saying about the market? And they are wrong. Don't believe the, the propaganda, and that's what it is. When you're listening to an analyst on a lot of these popular financial right. shows, um, are these are the mainstream Wall Street firms? You're not getting investment advice. You're getting propaganda. The failed policy and, and, and it's not uh, it's not working at all. And we don't change anything. We, if, if we got in this trouble because we had low interest rates, getting businessmen and savers to do the wrong thing, just doing more of the wrong thing continuously, I can't see how this is going to be helpful. My question to you, Mr. Chairman, is this. Um, what will it take for you to say to yourself, um, could I be wrong? You know, what if I'm mistaken? You know, uh, how long is this going to go on? Nine trillion dollars? What if, say, in five years from now, we're in a deep, deep slump with 
your definition of inflation, what if we have high prices going and the economy is very, very weak and unemployment is high, would you say to yourself then, boy, maybe I really messed up, maybe I was on the wrong track, maybe the free market people were right, maybe Keynes was wrong. Would you ever consider that? Or a common defense of the state holds that man is a social animal, that he must live in society, and that individualists and libertarians believe in the existence of atomistic individuals, uninfluenced by and unrelated to their fellow men. But no libertarians have ever held individuals to be isolated atoms. On the contrary, all libertarians have recognized the necessity and the enormous advantages of living in society, and of participating in the social division of labor. The great non-sequitur committed by defenders of the state, including classical Aristotelian and Thomist philosophers, is to leap from the necessity of society to the necessity of the state. On the contrary, as we have indicated, the state is an antisocial instrument, crippling voluntary interchange, individual creativity, and the division of labor. Society is a convenient label for the voluntary interrelations of individuals, in peaceful exchange and on the market. Here we may point to Albert J. Knox's penetrating distinction between social power, the fruits of voluntary interchange in the economy and in civilization, and state power, the coercive interference and exploitation of those fruits. In that light, Knox showed that human history is basically a race between state power and social power, between the beneficent fruits of peaceful and voluntary production and creativity on the one hand, and the crippling and parasitic blight of state power upon the voluntary and productive social process. All of the services commonly thought to require the state, from the coining of money to police protection to the development of law in defense of the rights of person and property, can be and have been supplied far more efficiently and certainly more morally by private persons. The state is in no sense required by the nature of man. Quite the contrary. I'm Larry Michelle. I'm the president of the Economic Policy Institute. I want to welcome all those here, uh, as well as those over the web who are, are watching us. Uh, we're very privileged today to, um, to have uh, Paul Krugman come talk about his new book. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go over sort of the choreography of the event, which is uh, first Paul's going to talk. Uh, then there's going to be some questions and answers. To be able to ask a question, you have to fill out the cards that were on the chairs. And then our uh, very able staff will at some point collect the cards. And our very able acting research director, Josh Bivens, uh, will then, uh, after Paul is done, uh, ask the questions from the cards. Um, after the Q&A, we will have uh, book signing. There's opportunities for those who are here to buy the book. Those who are on the web, uh, click on um, some bookstore that uh, you can buy the, uh, the book at. Um, uh, have it be a union bookstore. Don't go to Amazon. Uh, OK. Uh, we're very glad to have Paul. Uh, just to say uh, a minute, uh, one of the things, obviously, that led him to write this book is a great passion about the harm of the jobs crisis. This is a passion that uh, we at EPI very much have shared with Paul. Uh, we were recommending stimulus in September 2007, which you might note is actually three months before the recession, uh, trying to get the House of Representatives to, in fact, start thinking about what to do, because we already knew that the unemployment rate was rising and, and what was coming. Um, uh, this, we've treated it, as he does, as a 10-alarm fire. Uh, that means you do everything you can to address it. It is priority number one uh, in economics. It is something that is uh, we have to address. And um, 
you know, we can't let go. Uh, it's also true that the unemployment rate now uh, is the unemployment rate that African Americans have in the best of times. So what that means is that even when we get the national unemployment rate down, we shouldn't forget that there's going to be groups of people that have unemployment that is still exceedingly high, and we need policies that address both lowering overall unemployment, that, but that also gets more equity in employment. Uh, just to say something about Paul, other than this shared passion, uh, we really admire the way he never lets go of this issue. Uh, as an enthusiastic reader of everything Paul writes, uh, it's always there. We appreciate that he names names. He's got an edge. We think of ourselves as a think tank that does great research, but is willing to have a bit of an edge. Uh, we appreciate that he's both analytical, uh, passionate, uh, and a great writer. And without further ado, Paul Krugman. Wow. Well, so um, while I figure out this technology, which is really only works properly for teenagers, but okay. Um, so the... Yeah, so let me say just what a, a privilege it is to be here. And, you know, EPI has been, uh, it, it's always been doing great work. But, in, again, in this crisis, it's, it's one of the great sources of, of light and, and hope and, and uh, hammering on the facts. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, good, good, good people, this is the best place I think I could uh, be to, to at least start the, the try, trying to get these ideas across in Washington. Um, so the question is, you know, why, why this book? Why, why have a book on, on the, uh, the situation right now? And part of the answer is that it is, um, as, as Clark says, 10 alarm fire. It is, it is the, the magnitude of the disaster um, tends to get forget, forgotten. We, we sort of we ask, you know, is the unemployment report a little bit better, a little bit worse than we expected this month? Um, but the ongoing disaster is huge. So Pew just came out this morning with uh, their latest update on long-term, on very long-term unemployment, more than a year. 3.9 million Americans have been out of work for more than a year. That's not counting the people who are driven out of the labor force. That's, that's a human disaster. It's corrosive, not just for the present, but for the future. A lot of those people, if this goes on, are never going to be back in the labor force. Uh, this is going to do enormous damage to our, our nation. And it's not, it's not a question of, um, are, will we have a double-dip recession? I don't know. It uh, doesn't matter. The point is the, the damage continues right now. Uh, young people. Uh, so I wrote about that for Monday. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the statistics tell the tale, but you have to think of what's behind it. This is a terrible, terrible environment for young people trying to start their working lives. Um, and we know from evidence of past slumps, which were nothing like as severe as this, that that will scar their careers for their entire lives. And it's going to, uh, again, it's, it, that also hurts us as, as a nation in the long term. Uh, today's, uh, today's young person trying to get started is tomorrow's uh, part of the tax base. So this is all going to be bad for us in the long run. Um, of course, I write about this all the time. So why a book? Um, and part of the answer is that um, the way I, you know, my usual stuff, which is writing columns, uh, writing blog posts, I, I think it's great. I think we actually have better economic discourse than we've ever had because of the availability of, of these new media and because, because we have good people writing, uh, writing about these things. But there is a feeling I have a lot of the time when, when doing this that I, I am playing a kind of game of whack-a-mole. Uh, that, I'll, that every time I make one argument, somebody will raise an objection, which I have already answered, but it was in a different article. You know, there is, the, uh, um, there is a, a problem of, of, of um, length limit, problem of, uh, anyway, even it, blog posts are, are a, a great communications medium, uh, but they are, uh, nobody reads or remembers them all. And so there's, it, I think it was important to put the argument all in one place. And in so doing, I think I learned some things that, that make it a, a stronger argument. You can ask the question, does it matter? Uh, aren't we so deadlocked uh, politically that nothing matters? I'd say that the, yes, there's a lot of political. Uh, it, it's a horrible uh, political situation, too. The, uh, uh, if you want to ask, what is the structural problem with the US economy? I'd say it's, it's not a structural problem with the economy. It's a structural problem with our politics. 
uh, in particular the fact that we have one party that has gone completely off the deep end and is, is not interested at all in helping to, to run this country unless they get to run it all. Um, but there is, there is a lot of genuine confusion out there as well. And since we're into naming names, you probably uh, saw, or many of you may have seen, I went on, uh, on this week, uh, which was shown, shown Sunday, though we actually taped it Friday. And uh, uh, I said, actually on set, as we, as we walked off, I said, we're doomed. Um, <laughs> um, and, and the reason was, there you had a group of people who are not, you know, that some, one, one has been a Republican candidate, but it wasn't all. Uh, just pure politics, and it was like it was like the punchline for some kind of joke, right? Uh, um, Carly Fiorina thinks it's all about corporate tax rates. David Walker thinks it's all about entitlements. Eric Schmidt thinks it's all about the shortage of certain very narrow specialties of high-skilled workers. Everybody had, um, basically everybody except J Jennifer Granholm and me had their own thing, um, and it's not. If, if that's still going on, then we have a discussion that really needs to be improved because this is not, in fact, a, a crisis which, where you have a laundry list of things that are going wrong. This is a problem of there is not enough demand in this economy. Just plain, there is not enough demand. There's not enough spending. Uh, of course, there are structural problems. There are always structural problems. There's always mismatch. That's nothing different. Uh, actually, we even have, a, again, one of those things I didn't have a chance to get in the book, but the San Francisco Fed just did a study of mismatch in the labor market and said, yes, there's significant mismatch between worker skills and, uh, and employer needs, but there always is, and there's no hint in their data that it's gotten any worse. This is a problem of, of a lack of demand. Um, and it is a problem that is not, in fact, hard to fix, except for the combination of politics and just intellectual confusion. So, um, so I use the word depression uh, in the title of the book advisedly. Um, Partly, of course, just to get people's attention, uh, that's, uh, which is important. We've got to do this. Um, but also because I think that is the right word to use. Uh, recession has a technical meaning. It basically means a period when everything's going down. Um, in many countries, it's defined as two quarters of GDP shrinkage. But in the US, it's defined as whatever the, uh, the Business Cycle Dating Committee says it is. But, it, but in practice, that means a period when stuff is going down. Um, a depression is a period when stuff is down for an extended period. So the Great Depression, let's call it uh, 1929 to 1940, that includes two recessions and two recoveries. There were periods of up. There were actually periods of fairly fast growth between 33 and 37. Um, but the fact of the matter is there was still mass unemployment all the way through. It was an economy that was not doing what it should have been doing, that was inflicting huge hu human suffering even when things were improving. And that's our situation right now. It's not, it's not as... Uh, uh, as severe as the Great Depression, that's, that's, not, that's not a great standard, right? Not, not as bad as the Great Depression. It's not exactly a slogan on which you want to run. Um, and, uh, and it's plenty bad. In fact, for what it's worth, uh, to the extent that we can retrocast and, and produce numbers comparable to those um, of today, looks like the unemployment rate in, by modern standards in 1937 was about 9% by current standards. So we're actually not that much better not significantly better than, than some parts of the Great Depression right now. Um, the, the other thing about depressions is that the rules are very different. Uh, and the rules are very different largely because, uh, because Uncle Ben can't uh, easily change monetary policy. He can with difficulty do stuff, and I gave him a good hard kick uh, for his own good over the weekend. Uh, but but the, the, the inability to cut interest rates any further, short-term interest rates, which are the ones that the Fed directly controls, changes everything. It means that a lot of things that would normally be at least arguably good things to do no longer become good things to do. It's, it becomes a world, I wrote this early on, and it's still true, a world in which, uh, in which virtue is vice and, and prudence is folly, in which doing things that sound virtuous are actually deeply destructive. Um, and, and we've been doing those things that may sound good but are actually deeply destructive. So whatever, you know, when, the, when the Obama stimulus plan was announced, uh, um, there's a lot of interesting, I think, willful rewriting of history. Read many, many articles, and you'll, you'll see at least the implicit claim that all, that all people like Larry or me uh, were saying it would work. No, we weren't. We were, I was, t I was very, certainly publicly, uh, very publicly tearing my hair out because it was clear that it was way inadequate. Just, just from the numbers that, that were available even in January of 2009. And since early 2010, what we've actually done in this country and in Europe in different, different ways, but we've actually 
not such different numbers when all is said and done as we've actually done the reverse of stimulus. We've been doing austerity. Um, we've had unprecedented fall in public employment, unprecedented cutback in purchases of goods and services. Some transfer programs have expanded because so many people need them. So yes, we're, we're spending more on food stamps than unemployment insurance, but that's, not, that's only because we have so many people in, in desperation uh, one way or another. Um, and it's been all around destructive. It's not even positive on the, uh, on the fiscal side. You say, oh, well, at least, at least we're reducing the deficit. Are we? Uh, we're shrinking the economy. Uh, we're it's making the budget uh, revenues lower. We probably are getting some short-run reduction in the deficit numbers, though much less than one for one. Um, but we're also uh, damaging the future. Those long-term unemployed, many of whom will never re-enter the labor force, those young people who never get properly started on those careers, that's going to hurt our future. And it's even, even in purely fiscal terms, that's going to hurt our, our, um, our prospects for, for servicing the debt, um, which is not, you know, it might have seemed like an outlandish position early on, uh, but is at this point, uh, it, it's, it's pretty clear from the numbers. And, um, uh, and now that he's a free man, even Larry Summers is saying that, uh, with, uh, along with Brad DeLong in a really excellent paper just, just, just recently. A um, lot of really bad, a um, lot, lot of really bad uh, economic advice and thinking going on, which needs to be shot down. Uh, part of it is this structural story. People have keep on this kind of this insistence that it must be the case that that uh, that the unemployment is the result of deep underlying structural factors. Um, there is no evidence for that. It's not too hard. Actually, Dean Baker, um, another com comrade in arms on this stuff, uh, had a, a fun blog post where he quoted the Washington Post about businesses saying that there are shortages of skilled labor, even in, in, uh, in, despite high unemployment. And, and only at the end does he reveal it's actually it's a story from the Washington Post in 1935. <laughs> um, and I, I actually had found similar things from, 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 uh, from other sources. It's, uh, people always say that at times of depression, but it's not true. We're, we're, uh, yes, there are mismatches. As I said, there are always mismatches between workers, and, but no more than usual. That's not what's going on here. Other bad economics. The turn to austerity, which took place uh, um, both intellectually and, and as a policy matter, and on both sides of the Atlantic, beginning in, in, in early 2010, um, was justified with amazing stuff. One important thing to understand in all of this is that people like me are not preaching some outlandish radical economic theory. We're actually saying, take your textbook seriously. Take, take, take what we know, take what we learn from economics, from, from 80 years of experience, and apply it to, to the situation. It's just uh, we don't often find ourselves in depression conditions, but we do have a pretty good guide to what works and what doesn't. But in the face of this, a lot of policymakers, a lot of pundits, chose to pull out of thin air some concepts that, that, uh, that would uh, justify doing the opposite of what actually more or less standard economics would say. So we, the notion that, that uh, cutting spending, which depresses the economy, doesn't actually depress the economy because somehow it improves confidence and leads to more spending. Uh, the notion that even though the numbers say that debt is not actually anything close to a pressing issue for the United States, that we can quite easily service the debt that we have, and particularly we can quite easily service the debt that we're running up right now, not to say it's a good thing, but it's not a crisis issue, but inventing the notion that despite that logic, the markets are going to attack us any day now, and you should believe that because the person saying it says it, even though the markets don't seem to actually think so and are willing to lend the U.S. government money long term at very low interest rates. So I think my contribution to the English language, which will probably be the enduring uh, legacy of all the stuff I've been doing, is, is, uh, is I've introduced the character of the confidence fairy. Uh, people believing that you can slash spending, depress the economy, but it won't really be depressing because the confidence theory will come in. And okay, and we've had a test, right? So you never get to do totally clean experiments in economics. It would be unethical to do totally clean experiments in economics. Uh, it would violate the Princeton uh, research guidelines. Um, but the uh, human experimentation, there's a line and all of that about that. Um, but we, we've conducted what is, is, is a damn good approximation to a controlled experiment. 
Uh, we didn't get to do a controlled experiment in stimulus because it was never enough, basically was never enough even to offset the cutbacks at the state and local level. But we've had one hell of an experiment in austerity. And it's, uh, and the, the, the results are in. If you, uh, if you do a scatter plot of, uh, of the size of austerity measures in European countries versus the change in GDP, it is a downward sloping line. It is, uh, austerity has been contractionary with a vengeance. Um, and it has been, in fact, it, the coefficient is 1.3. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty tight relationship. And uh, so we've just seen that there, the confidence very consent, continues to not make an appearance. We've just seen a confirmation of a particular view of, of the way the economy works, which happens to be the view that those of us who have been pleading for more, not less government spending, have held all along. Um, there are other things we should be doing. As I said, I've been, uh, I guess one thing just to say is that this, this is not something that came totally out of the blue. Um, they, some of us, uh, a long time back, uh, almost 15 years ago, looked at what was happening in Japan and saw that as a cautionary tale. It did seem to say that, that you can, in fact, get into an economic trap where it's not so easy. You can't just rely on the central bank to get you out. Um, and, uh, and we saw uh, that as a potential future for the United States. There was actually a little cluster at Princeton, me, uh, Mike Woodford, Lars Svensson, and Ben Bernanke, uh, all worried about this. And one of the possible actions was monetary policy. This is a time when adventurous, unconventional monetary policy can help. You wouldn't want to rely on it entirely. Uh, but it certainly can help. So uh, as, you, as you know, I've been reminding Chairman Bernanke of what Professor Bernanke used to say, and Professor Bernanke was right. I want to say one last thing and then throw it open. Um, why is this book different from any other book? Um, why, why, there have been a lot of books on the crisis and a lot of really excellent books on the crisis. The great bulk of them have been backward looking. They've been, how did this happen? Um, and uh, either how did it happen in the... Um, uh, in, in the bubble, what, what, went, went, what went down during the bubble, or what did the Obama administration do, what were the fumbles, whatever. And that's all worthy stuff. But there's also, there's two problems with that. One is that there is, and this is something I've noticed long before even we got to this, there is this tendency to focus, it's almost a prurient interest thing, to focus on the excesses of, of, the, of the boom. People love to dwell on the excesses of the boom, on the bad lending, on the irrational exuberance. They love to talk about all the things that, that, that foolish people did during the, during the good years, um, which is fine, but you, know, you should be focusing a lot on what happens afterwards and what you can do about it. Uh, and that tends to get, get shot down. So one of, one, of the, um, one of the John Maynard Keynes remains our best guide to, to uh, lots, of, lots of what he wrote applies verbatim to the, to the situation we're in. And one of his great things was what he decided not to discuss in his theory, not, or except briefly in a chapter near the end of, of his book, which was he didn't try to talk about the business cycle. He didn't try to talk about why booms happen and why they're followed by busts. He said, okay, you're, you've had the bust. You are now in a depression. How does it work and what can you do about it? And that's, that is the most urgent question. Not, not uh, you don't want to, the, turn it into a morality play and focus on the excesses and get, get all obsessed with, with the, the crazy things people did and then, by implication, suggest that, that the suffering that follows is right and appropriate. It isn't. It's not appropriate because, uh, because uh, there's no good reason to waste large amounts of, of, of your productive capital, uh, just, just of your productive capacity, just because there were some excesses in the past. And it's not right because, by and large, the people who are suffering are not the people who, who engaged in the excesses to begin with. So this, this is, you really need to focus on that. And then the question now is not, I mean, it's interesting to ask how we got here, but the question is, what do we do now? And this book, oh, I need to say one more thing. One, and then I'll, I'll throw it up. One, one, one insight that really came to me in trying to put this book together is that there's a lot of water under the bridge since we were all desperately pleading for a, a better stimulus program back, in, uh, back when, when, when the Obama administration was just moving in. And one of the things that happened is that we've had three years of policy moving in the wrong direction. 
Um, instead of stimulus, we've actually had austerity. And that means that actually the task of getting something moving now is much easier than it was then. We don't need to talk about shovel-ready projects. We just need to talk about reversing that austerity that's taking place. We need to talk about rehiring those school teachers and, and resuming the road repair programs that have very visibly been neglected, uh, certainly in my state, and I think just about every place else. Uh, we can, so I'd actually do some math there. Just by getting back to normal levels of state and local employment relative to population, uh, you can get 1.3 million workers. You can, you can add 1.3 million people to employment right away. Just by getting back to normal levels of state and local spending on real goods and services, uh, you can get 300 billion a year. In, in aid to the economy. That's enough almost certainly to get us below 7% unemployment to get us into a much, much better economic uh, frame. Um, so it's not, it's technically not hard. It's politically hard, no question about that. Um, and, and there's an intellectual task because a lot of people have got their minds wrapped around this thing the, entirely the wrong way, but that's why we write books. And with that, I'll throw it open. So if people could uh, write down questions they had on the cards on the seat and start passing them forward, and we'll have some EPI staff collect them from you at the front, if I could have some staff. And then while that happens, I will go ahead and ask a couple questions. So my first one is going to be <laughs> completely counter to the spirit at the end of your talk and purely backward looking and assigning blame and casting aspersion. Um, I'm, I'm all for that, too. I mean, it's just a, <laughs> it's a secondary priority, but uh, aspersions are, are, are enjoyable. But it's mostly spurred by uh, – there have been a couple articles that have popped up, and they seem to pop up about once a year, and they talk about how good TARP was. And TARP was unpopular, but that's only because the public are kind of grubby populists and don't understand the issue. And so I'm wondering, you know, given that a lot of the horror show scenarios that TARP was supposed to stop was actually stopped by the Fed – given the TARP is wildly unpopular and got merged with the stimulus in people's mind and made it that much harder to do more support for the economy? I mean, marginal cost versus benefit of, of TARP. Um, I don't think you dared, given, given the way the world was in, <coughs> in the fall of, of 2008, I don't think you, you dared not have something like TARP. I mean, we now know that maybe it wasn't as crucial as it seemed, but, you know, the, the, there was a backstopping that went on. So I, I don't think – in conscience, you could have actually uh, chosen not to do that. It, it was it, – something like that was, was necessary. And, it, yeah, it, it's been merged uh, – but that's partly uh, – so it's been merged in, in the public mind with the stimulus, which is a, a really bad thing. But that, I think, could have been, been mitigated in other ways. What I wanted, argued for at great length in, in, uh, in, in all the right places, uh, was that TARP um, – to, st to have TARP but have more strings, that there – uh, I still believe you could have found a way to uh, to put at least one major bank into receivership uh, as a condition for aid. It, it was tricky, but lots of tricky things have happened, and uh, I think it could have been done. And it would have it would have done that. It would serve two purposes. One, it would have served to encourage the others, um, um, and the other is that it would have um, uh, done a lot to diffuse the public perception that this was all just a big giveaway to the bankers. So, I would have done tarp with strings. But I would have done TARP, but it would have, it would have been a much, a much tougher deal for the people on the receiving end than what we actually got. Okay. So, totally random picking here. Yeah, um, <laughs> looks like a game of solitaire. Okay. That's right. So, is part of the problem of the recession capital allocation by our financial markets? Uh, money extracted by LBOs from the real economy may not go back to the real economy, but instead stays on Wall Street and is invested in financial products, et cetera. Um, I think that would also be part of the recession as well as maybe the lead up to the recession as well. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that there's uh, – I'm not sure that, uh, that that is actually the story right now. I think there was clearly some misallocation of, of, of capital, of savings, uh, a lot of misallocation. I mean, we, we had all this wonderful structure of modern f sophisticated finance that was supposed to make it possible to do all kinds of – great channeling of, of money into productive channels, and, and instead it went to, to pay for, uh, for condos in Miami. That's kind of not what we, we had in mind. Um, and uh, so that's certainly part of the story. I don't think it's part of the story of why we're in a mess right now. I think the, uh, if you actually try to ask why, 
why we were why why that we don't recover uh you would add, you would point more to to the uh overhang of of household debt that was left behind by the bubble now the the bubble was certainly facilitated by all those financial wheeling and dealing which concealed the risks and and so on but it, it probably had multiple causes and um and that's the story right now uh, actually this is another thing i want to say the we also focus a lot too much in our discussions on the financial sector's problems. And it's true that the heat of the crisis was very much about um, a breakdown of the financial system. And there was a period from September 15, 2008 till about late March of 2009 when, when financial markets were really, really disrupted. Uh, the, uh, I've been calling it the, oh, God, we're all going to die period. And it was a uh, – uh, but that's long since gone, and yet we don't have a strong recovery which is telling you that the underlying problem is much more about things like household debt, debt than it is about financial sector. The financial sector went bluey, went, went crazy, but it was pretty much bailed out. And the fact of the matter is that was not enough. So how do you see the link between rising inequality that preceded both the Great Depression and the Great Recession? Is there a mechanical economic link? Are they both a function of something else like financial deregulation? Do they just make policy that much harder because of polarization? Um, how do you see those three those things going together? Yeah. Okay. That's that's a so this is this is you know when I I used to give occasional public talks about inequality before the crisis there'd always be and I say you know we reached levels of inequality not seen since 1929, and there will always be some of the other ones saying, oh, 1929, and I kind of brushed them off, and what do you know? Um, turns out that it was the precursor to a, another depression. Um, the channels are not, that, are not as clear in the causation as I'd like to. Um, they, it's not, it's a, you know, I could get too deep into the weeds here, but the, the simple stories are not that easy to tell. If you, if we, we're not, we were not obviously suffering from underconsumption. Um, we were suffering from arguably from lower income households piling up too much debt because of the problems caused by inequality. Um, we were, inequality was partly caused, significant, a quite significant part of the t top end was about financial deregulation. And conversely, uh, the pressures from the empowered uh, elite probably reinforced financial deregulation. So you ask the question, you know, financial deregulation was actually a series of disasters almost from day one. Right, savings and loan crisis uh, started, and even to some extent, the the, uh, the third world debt crisis of the 80s all represented early disasters of deregulation. Uh, so why did we keep on doing it? And the answer has to be at least in part that they may have been disasters for the economy at large, but not for certain people. But I think the main story now, the main thing about inequality now, is that it is um, in a couple of ways uh, contributing to our inability to deal with this. Political polarization, uh, is, is a large part of it, and the, the degradation of economic discussion. I mean, uh, if, we, if we'd had this crisis in 1971, when Richard Nixon had just declared, uh, I am now a Keynesian, um, I think we would have responded pretty effectively. We would have had quite a lot of bipartisanship in saying we need to deal with this. Uh, we would have had quite a lot of intellectual agreement on what needed to be done. So what happened to all of that? Well, the, the bipartisanship, the possibility of it, went away with political polarization, which is closely, you know, mathematically. Fairly linked to, 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 uh, to inequality. There, that's a, that's, that's a, as, as good a relationship as you're going to find anywhere in social science. Um, and then um, the... If you look at what's happened to our economic discussion, uh, you found that, that what was a sensible consensus about the way the economy worked, uh, I, a, a set of views that actually has, has performed very well in this crisis. Okay, so if you took, uh, sorry, economic job, but if you had an ISLM liquidity trap view of the way the world works, you've been calling it almost entirely right since this crisis began. And yet that was rejected, and you have, there's stuff that goes on inside the economics profession, but even more broadly, you have a whole lot of um, uh, crank and charlatan doctrines, uh, to quote Greg Mankiw from, from, from his younger days, um, which have now become the, the, uh, more or less the official line of, of half the political spectrum. What do we know about these crank doctrines? Uh, they were always the doctrines that, uh, um, that certain billionaires liked. And uh, what, what you've basically had is that, that, the, um, that 
that bad economics that appealed to the uh, uh, to the self-interest and and maybe the the vanity of of a few uh, very rich people uh, has now become mainstreamed because those very rich people are richer than ever and they've essentially bought control of a large part of the political process. Does expansionary monetary policy fuel asset bubbles like the housing crisis? What does that say for the mix of monetary and fiscal policy? And what signs would you look for that signal the limits of expanding U.S. public debt to fight the recession? Well, wow. okay. Um, so the expansionary do, – do we think that, that the Fed uh, caused the housing bubble and, and thereby that, that too low interest rates led to, to this disaster? A couple of reasons to think not. Uh, so I, 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 I've never bought that uh, story. I'm, I'm not you know, totally hard line against it, but I don't think it's, it, it fits the facts. Uh, the, you could do it a number of different ways, but, but low interest rates don't, don't mean that you have to have um, – this kind of explosion of debt to levels um, never, never before seen, uh, or not seen since the 1920s, actually. Um, the real interest rates were lower in the 70s than, than they were in, in, the, in the early noughties. Uh, that there, this is not, it's not clear that, the, that things were, were further out of whack than normal this time. Um, what you had this time, however, was that the previous times when we had very low real interest rates were, were when you still had effective regulation of the financial system. So I would say that that if, if that's the the, uh, the that the, the difference, the reason we, we were vulnerable to that kind of bubble was because of deregulation. Um, and for, by and large, you know, if you have a an economic system that has catastrophic crises, if the management of the central bank is a little bit too relaxed for a couple of years, then that's not a workable economic system. You have to have a system that is robust to, to, to the human failings of, of the monetary managers. Um, so that's, uh, that would be my story. Oh, and, uh, sorry, I also mentioned that you, know, you, you have these twin. Um, in, in the buildup to the crisis, the United States and Europe are basically twins. And, you know, basically, Spain is Florida. Uh, Ireland and Nevada look identical, except it, unless you look out the window. And the, uh, um, and the Europeans, European Central Bank was never as expansionary as the Fed. So that's clearly telling you that something else was going on. Um, fiscal, yeah. Um, look for some hint that the markets were at least marginally worried. That would be one, one way to look at it. Um, and you can also you can do the arithmetic. Actually, you know, ask, does um, taking reasonable projections about real interest rates and, and, uh, and the actual cost of servicing debt, does this look like a, a crushing burden? Not, not uh, just... There's a lot of kind of personal – there's an argument this, – this is a line from, from other sources – but the argument from personal incre incredulity. I can't believe that we can have debt of more than 100 percent of GDP without a financial crisis. Well, that's fine, but why do you believe that? Britain had debt that was more than 100 percent of GDP for most of the 20th century. Uh, Japan, people have been calling the imminent debt crisis in Japan um, since, since uh, 2000. Um, and have people who bet on it have, have lost their shirts again and again. It's, it's been called the, the trade of death, uh, betting on, on the coming Japanese debt crisis. Last I looked, their 10-year their rate was under, under 0.9 percent. There's a lot more resilience for a country that has its own currency, borrows in its own currency. There's a lot more resilience. So you know, call me back when we're at 150 percent of GDP, and, uh, and we can talk about it. But uh, – Oh, and one more thing to add. Sorry, long answers to short questions. Um, even if you're worried, what on earth would make you think that slashing spending in the current environment is going to do you any good? Right? It's, uh, actually, let me tell you, I, I did Reddit uh, yesterday, uh, which was an interesting experience. And, uh, um, and someone actually asked the question, how much would we have to cut spending to balance the budget if we were going to do it just by cutting spending? And what would the effect be on the economy if we did? So we have – we can actually answer that reasonably well. We can uh, – we have some notion – we can use those Europe, that European experience to ask how much, how much actual deficit improvement do you get uh, from, from top-line austerity give, once you take into account the effect on the economy. Uh, and um, so I, I came up with something like this. To, to eliminate a trillion-dollar deficit, we'd probably have to cut spending by at least $1.5 trillion because you'd be depressing revenue. That would, in turn, uh, that's 10% of, of GDP. Uh, that would, in turn, shrink the economy by about 
given the best estimates we've got of the multiplier. Uh, so we would be driving unemployment up to 15% or more. Uh, we'd be uh, putting a 12 or 13 million people out of work. Um, you know, that's, this, is not, this is not a strategy. This is not going to happen. And, and when people say, oh, we really have to worry about the debt limit, you have to ask, well, why, why even if you're worried, you're, you're, are, are you proposing anything that wouldn't actually make the situation worse? And as far as I can tell, they aren't. What do you think about the debate about the financial transaction tax in Europe during the last couple months? Is that a hopeful sign? Should the U.S. follow the lead? Yeah, I think it's a good – I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that – a lot of went wrong, what went wrong is – there is this tendency to focus on hot money, and financial transactions tax discourages that, encourages people to invest a little bit longer term. Now, hot money is not actually at the core of the crisis. I mean, the, the, the core of the crisis – the core of where we are now is actually long-term borrowing. It's, it's mortgages, not not uh, not speculators moving their money back in, in over, over a millisecond. But that said, hot, hot money has clearly been a destabilizing force. Uh, a financial transactions tax is a way of raising money that is uh, for the long term. That's probably a good thing. There is essentially no evidence that these hyper-reactive, super-fluid financial markets we've created over the past 30 years are doing anybody any good except for, except for a handful of traders. So for, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it. I don't think it's going to solve a lot of problems, but it's, it's a good thing. Why aren't economists speaking out more unanimously, or at least in greater consensus, for, for good policies? Are they too afraid? Do they dislike controversy? Are they too removed from the real world? Uh, all of the above. Salting is another. Uh, no, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. One, one is people. This is not. Uh, gosh, the amount. The amount. Um, there are not many. Uh, there are not many people in, in my profession who would particularly enjoy getting the email and the voicemails I get in, a, in an ordinary day. Right? It's just uh, um, you have to. T it, for the first couple of years, I was pretty. Uh, you know, I've learned I've learned to roll with it, but it is pretty shocking. It's 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 an ugly world out there, and you can understand why people are are reluctant to get too engaged, especially if they want to be doing fundamental research. Um, there's a lot of politicization. Um, a lot of uh, you know, it, it, that's that's America today. There's so much political polarization, so much politicization that people uh, find themselves, uh, you know, or, or choose to to uh, well, like like my friend Brad DeLong says, play for Team Republican. Uh, I guess I, there are some who play for Team Democrat, but I don't think it's anything like the same thing. Again, the, the parties are not symmetric here. So people whose underlying model of the economy, as far as I can tell, is not so different from mine, find ways to side with the, with the, uh, with, with the Republicans, on even, even when they're talking obvious nonsense. Um, there is a structure of incentives uh, uh, of all, at all levels. Um, you know, the, there, there's there's consulting, there's think tanks, there's. Uh, um, I've been blackballed from Jackson Hole since since I since I criticized Alan Greenspan in 2001. Right? If you want to go to that meeting, you're even when they devoted the one one session. I'm not bitter about this because I don't care, but it's just funny. Um, they had one to, uh, devoted to new economic geography, and I was not invited. So that's you know that's how that's how these things work. So it's um, uh, it's a uh, a whole set of, of and it's it's sad. Because this is where, you know, if ever there was a time when, when a, some clear declaration of basic principles uh, would be really helpful, uh, now is it. Um, some of us talk quite a lot about how, given the current way that policy is discussed, Milton Friedman would be on the left of the political debate. That tells you how far we've degenerated. So I think I'm just going to do one more, and then we'll move on to, to book signing. Two more. I told, okay. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, but just a couple more words maybe. I mean, how, how helpful or harmful, I think you think helpful, has sort of the rise of blogs and the Internet and all that been for the quality of discourse? And, and how do you explain, if you can, the fact that the quality of economic argument and credential are seeming to be pretty uncorrelated these days when it comes to economics? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first part, I think it's been spectacular. I mean, whether it's doing any good for the world, I don't know. That's that's always the problem here. But the, but no, the the quality, the, the sort of real time, economic discussion that's been going on these past several years is awesomely good. I mean, there are some people saying really bad, stupid things, uh, but there always are. But the 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 ability of people who are 
honestly and intelligently trying to grapple with what's going on to interact um, in, in, with, with others able to, to, to follow has been amazing. I think we've this, this, it's been, you know, we're kind of living in, a, in, in an Athens of, of, uh, of the cyberspatial mind or something on, on, when it comes to economics these past years. It's small consolation for the enormous amount of human mystery, but it's actually been, been pretty good. Um, it's not uncorrelated. The, I, my sense is that the, the best econo bloggers, they may not always have the, the you know, sterling academic credentials, but they're people who are, who are, who are well-versed, who are sophisticated in it. But we've also had this, this oh yeah, I wrote about it in the Times Magazine way back when, uh, um, macroeconomics, uh, the macroeconomics profession. Uh, a large part of it went seriously off the rails. And uh, and one of the virtues, I think, actually, of the of this more open discussion is that it's easier to see that uh, there's a lot more visibility of what the actual quality of the arguments are, and you can see just how bad some of the arguments that have become professionally pr prominent, that have become have become stepping stones to promotion and tenure, actually really are in practice. And I guess the last one to to be forward looking, like you urged at the end of your talk, right? But what needs to happen over the next couple of years, and I guess as importantly, how can anyone who is not kind of in the political elite or even econo bloggers, how can they help make that happen, if at all? Okay, um, so you know, I'm not a total pessimist. Um, I actually think that there are natural healing forces slowly working in the economy. Household debt coming down a little bit in absolute terms and, and more substantially relative to income. So that debt overhang is slowly being worked off. Um, the housing, you know, we had a great overbuilding of housing, but we built no houses basically for six years. So, so we're in some ways the, the, the conditions are, are there for a recovery. Um, and so we will probably, you know, we will have a gradual, in the long run we will recover from this. In the long run we are all dead, but, uh, but, but we can move it on. Uh, only a modest improvement in policy could accelerate that. And so I'm, I'm, I, I can see how this could be not too bad a story uh, over the next five years. Um, the public, well, you know, think, think about it. It's a, Occupy Wall Street was an incredibly scrappy, uh, um, somewhat inchoate thing, and yet it changed the conversation enormously. So having people, one way or another, through demonstrations, through, uh, uh, through letter-writing campaigns, uh, um, Basically, say, hey, we don't, we don't believe what, uh, we don't accept what this uh, privileged circle of, of insiders who have been wrong about everything uh, has to say uh, can have a big impact. And if I may say that, that uh, wearing one of my hats, journalists are um, much more thin-skinned by and large than you would imagine. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a skin like a rhinoceros now, but the, uh, but, but people, uh, they are shocked to have letters from the public saying, why aren't you telling the truth about this? And they get upset, but their reporting also improves afterwards. So I think actually ordinary citizens can have more impact than they think on, on, on the way we discuss these things and ultimately on the, on the kinds of policies we have. Great. Okay. Well, let's just thank Paul. Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, we're going to let people line up on the aisle if you have a book and you would like Paul to sign it. Then please um, line up. If you don't have a book to sign, then you have to go out there and get a book. And thank you very much. Thank you for joining us over the web. Thank you for coming. Come back to www.epi.org anytime. The Peter Schiff Show. I'm going to play a sequence of clips from CNN. Paul Krugman was on over the weekend. First, I'm going to play cut number four. Think about World War II, right? That was not, that was actually negative social product spending, and yet it brought us out. I mean, partly because you want to put these things together. If we say, look, we could use some inflation, Ken and I are both saying that, which is, of course, anathema to a lot of people in, in, in Washington, but is, in fact, what the basic logic says it's very hard to get inflation in a depressed economy but if you had a program of government spending plus an expansionary policy by the Fed you could get that so if you think about using all of these things together you could accomplish you know a great deal so here is Paul Grugman again repeating the the false premise that the spending in the Second World War got us out of the depression and what he's saying is we need more spending and we need inflation 
He's saying that inflation is going to help us get out of our problems. And he said it's very hard to create inflation in a depressed economy. No, it's not. It's really easy. You just print money. Look at all the inflation in Zimbabwe. I mean, how much more depressed can an economy get? Is it difficult for the Zimbabwe government to create inflation? No, it's easy. You just run money off a printing press. I mean, one of the easiest things for governments to do is to create inflation. And in fact, the weaker your economy is, the easier it is to create that inflation. But again, what Paul Krugman is saying is that we need something like World War II. And he comes up with his own way to stimulate the economy. And if you remember, and if you don't, I wrote a column on, on Europac.net, and somebody actually turned it into a video, which I favored it on my YouTube channel. So go check it out. Where I wrote a very tongue-in-cheek commentary about, hey, if World War II really got us out of the Depression, let's have World War III to get us out of this. And I said, but wait a minute, we don't want to have all the death and destruction uh, to get all the benefits. So I said, let's have a fake <clears throat> World War III with, you know, with paintball and stink bombs and let's spend all this money, but let's, let's make it fake. And that way we get all the benefits without people having to die. Now, I did that as a joke. Now, Paul Krugman actually comes up with his own solution, but he's serious. See, I was joking. This guy is, is, is actually serious. Here, play cut number five. I mean, if, if, we, if we discovered that uh, you know, space aliens were planning to attack and we needed a, a massive buildup to counter the, the space alien threat um, and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary uh, place to that, um, this slump would be over in 18 months. And then if we discovered, whoops, we made a mistake. There aren't actually any space aliens. So we need aliens. Orson Welles, be better... what you're saying. No, that's a, that's a, there was a Twilight Zone episode like this in which uh, scientists fake a, uh, an alien threat in order to achieve world peace. Well, this time we don't need it. We need it in order to get some fiscal stimulus. All right, there it is. I mean, I would nominate Paul Krugman for the Nobel Prize for Stupidity on that statement alone. And I challenge anybody to find a statement that would, would, would top that. I mean, here's what he's saying. We need to get the whole world ready for an alien invasion. That's not actually going to happen. That's all a mistake. But we should spend all of our resources building weapons to combat aliens. Maybe we need to you know, build huge cities underground so that we can hide out uh, from these aliens that don't exist. I mean, basically, think about what Paul Krugman is saying, is that we need a new bubble, but not a technology bubble or a housing bubble, but a bubble in defense spending to repel an alien attack, right? I mean, think about it. He wants a massive misallocation of resources on a global scale. You see, what was the tech bubble? See, we invested in Internet companies that really weren't viable, they weren't profitable, and so ultimately uh, when the, we realized that, we had a, a recession. And then we had a housing bubble where we built houses we didn't need and we couldn't afford. So what is Krugman thinks we should do now? We should prepare for a non-existent alien threat so that we can have a gigantic bubble of, around investing in a global defense system to protect us from these non-existent aliens. And if we do this, according to Krugman, we're going to have an economic boom. How? If we take resources that we need to use for things that we actually want, that can wake up, make our lives better, and instead we waste those resources preparing for an alien space battle that's never going to happen, how is that? going to help the economy. I mean, this man went to college, he studied economics, and this is the best thing he could come up with? This is his economic stimulus? Prepare for a phony alien invasion? I mean, people look up to this guy. I mean, this is, this is off the charts lunacy. But you know what? Hey, you know, it makes sense if you're a Keynesian. Anyway, I got a little bit more sound to go into a Paul Krugman's psyche. I, to understand how this man thinks and the delusions of grandeur he actually harbors in secret. Here, this is from a 2008 interview uh, on uh, NobelPrize.org with uh, Adam Smith. Uh, I guess not the Adam Smith, but a an Adam Smith. Uh, hey, play this. This is cut number six. I was an avid science fiction reader when I was a teenager. And there's the classic set of novels by Isaac Asimov, the Foundation novels, which are about how a group of social scientists save galactic civilization through their understanding of the laws that determine the behavior of societies. And uh, I wanted to be one of those guys. Uh, and the closest you can get at this point, I'm afraid, is being an economist. So Paul Krugman wanted to save the world. And he thinks he's going to save it as an economist? What is an economist going to do to save the world? 
I mean, talk about delusions of grandeur. And listen to this, it gets better. Here's how Paul Krugman thinks he's going to save the world as Super Krugman. I mean, maybe we ought to dress him up in like a Superman outfit with a big cape, and he can have like a big, you know, E on his chest, you know, for super economists, and he's going to come and he's going to save the world. And here is how this superhero, Paul Krugman, thinks he's going to single-handedly save the world. Cut number seven. Do you still believe that economists have that role? Oh, it can't, you know, the, um, in the novels, these people are able to predict with high accuracy what's going to happen and find the precise intervention that, that saves civilization. Um, economics doesn't work that good. Uh, but, um, but no, it's, it's, it, there's a tr tremendous amount of understanding that comes from economic models, and sometimes that understanding can be can be the salvation of the economy. Uh, I believe that we're in, living in one of those times right now. If we had only the level of economic knowledge that the world had in 1929, I believe we would have another Great Depression. The reason to believe that that won't happen is that we think we understand this thing at least somewhat better than our grandfathers did. So there we have it. He is going to save the world with his economic understanding. We're in a time now where it's not on the social sciences, but on the economists, that it's his job to save the world. We're about to collapse. And if we only had the knowledge that we had in 1929, we would collapse. But because of Paul Krugman and his super knowledge, because he has these brilliant economic models, he knows exactly what's wrong. And he's come up with a plan to save the world. And what is that? Well, we resurrect Orson Welles, and we fake an alien attack, a space alien attack, so we can ramp up uh, for an invasion that never happens. You know what? Hey, maybe in the world of Krugman, it would be better for the economy if it was a real alien invasion, and they annihilated us. They destroyed all of our buildings and all of our cities. Because you know what? That would really be stimulative, because now we would have to build them all back up again. Watch out for those aliens. Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. And tonight I want to speak to you about the debate between Paul Krugman and Ron Paul. Last night, as soon as it came out, I made a piece quickly. It wasn't to the quality uh, that I'm satisfied with. And tonight I'm not going to repeat anything I said in last night's presentation. But I have a more carefully crafted analysis of this debate. Uh, tonight's piece is entitled, The Problem with Krugman's Argument. My step-grandfather worked for the Federal Reserve. He was a conservative economist. His name is Paul Simpson. Look him up. He told me, and we agreed back about 10 years ago, that concentration of wealth was the greatest threat to America. Now, power and money are exchangeable. Watch Obama's net worth go from less than $1 million prior to his uh, Senate election, certainly, to over $100 million through the corruption as, of fame, as did Clinton. Those they benefited will pay fees to have them speak and fet them with favors. Uh, quid pro quo. Um, those they, uh, people will pay for their attention in hopes of connection. Of course, the old money Republicans, such as Bush, start filthy rich and end filthy, filthy rich. In the case of Romney, he started rich and is ending filthy, filthy rich, certainly. Krugman talks about unemployment. Economists tell other men what to do with their money, but they do not look at whether activity is desirable. That is not something they've learned how to measure. They call it pursuing your utilities. In other words, going to the whorehouse or being a professor have the same effect to an economist, by and large, because you're pursuing your interests. It's not up to them to judge whether they uh, have any relative merit. Uh, in my view, there's an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. You have from productive to non-productive, or, uh, yeah, that's good enough for the moment. And you have functional to non-functional. We want all activity to be productively engaged by people who enjoy doing it, who are pursuing their dream, and are functional. They weren't beaten as children in poverty-stricken meth homes with schools rotting apart. They lived with dignity. Their parents weren't constantly pressured to put out more and more and make do with less and less. That's my view of the middle class and the poor in America. 
Having 10 pairs of shoes made per person does not actually create wealth. It probably destroys wealth as at this point in our technology because ultimately infinite consumption may be possible with a more advanced technology but at this point it's destroying wealth because it merely exhausts the earth groaning under our consumption based economics because we don't have time to do anything but consume. If Krugman were really so smart, forgive me for putting it in such a childish way, he would look at these things and see what we want is to eliminate drudge work and pursue each of us our dreams. We have been taught that your work must lead to wealth, praise, notoriety, fame, to be of value. Of course things that others value are a lot easier to feel good about than things you enjoy doing and making only for yourself. But if you whittled which is to carve in wood, a sloop, which is a type of little boat, and give it to a boy. Does that not give you more satisfaction than to sell it on eBay for $100? What I'm talking about could come about in our lives, or it may take a thousand years, or it may never happen. It's up to us. But the things that make these visions, and this is not my utopia, people all over the world are talking about these things. And it is not communism, because what I agree with Ron Paul about and what he has taught me is that attraction is much better than compulsion and better even than promotion. A society seeking to eliminate compulsion and force. This is where interdisciplinary studies come in. This idea of trying to figure out which economic output has the greatest benefit. So you analyze people's health, their sanity, uh, and so forth. And to do that, you need perhaps psychology, sociology, medicine, and various other disciplines integrated with economics. And this is what they call, if I'm not mistaken, normative economics. But this is uh, still a field that is looked at somewhat dubiously by people like Krugman, if I'm not mistaken. We can thank the King of Bhutan, actually, for the National Happiness Index. Krugman does not analyze the utility of a particular form of ec economic activity. We do not need jobs. We need resources. We need access to clean food, a healthy environment, a low-stress life, sunlight, clean water, rest, and the ability to educate ourselves and to equip ourselves, not to consume, but to really live. All these things could be had by all if we focused on eliminating unnecessary activity and reduced activity to focus on productive activity. Now you may say, how does Ron Paul come in? If you'll wait just a moment, you'll see. And then we can build things we feel connected to. If you want to call it ownership, fine. But if you've ever been to a barn raising, the point is not that you own the barn. It is that you now have stronger friendships and your community is enriched and it's satisfying. What I have found is that if you had seven co-ops or credit unions uh, or owner-operated enterprises, you could have all the things that are needful in your life. Paul did well enough, Ron Paul, but he was not at his best. The man must be under tremendous pressure and exhausted. We all have good days and bad days. And to face Krugman, who has spent his entire life delving into economics full time, when Ron Paul, as much as he studied it, uh, it's like going against an Olympic athlete, uh, except you're, in my view, your uh, direction for the world is a much better direction than the Olympic athlete. He's simply technically more proficient. <clears throat> and again, I think you need more than one of these discussions to be able to assess whether Paul can actually defeat Krugman intellectually. But it's not about defeat, and Ron Paul is excellent at this. It's about wooing, it's about attraction. We don't have to defeat Paul Krugman. We need to have him begin to see these ideas in a new light. And Krugman responded to Paul when he talked about how he wanted to bring America back to his own parents. He didn't get a chance to finish that thought. <clears throat> eliminate jobs but create wealth. Our economy is driven on a fluff. Our main industries were called fire, 
finance, insurance, real estate, and uh, if I, if I, and, uh, real estate, right. And none of these actually create wealth. Real estate helps you locate a property and navigate the rules about acquisition of it. Uh, uh, finance uh, tells you to some extent what other people think about your business plan. Um, and insurance tells you how risky some activity that you're involved in uh, is. However, we are compelled to buy these things and we don't really need them in the types of quantities that we're talking about. So what I did is I went through the entire U.S. statistical abstract, which shows every job in the country. I figured out the ratio of nurses to people. And then you construct, like, uh, uh, put it in a box, make it into a pie, however you like. And I found that we only need 25% of these jobs to provide all that is needful. We need, okay. The other th uh, areas that are growing are prisons and war, bureaucracy, and national security. Go through the U.S. statistical abstract. Do the study, uh, the work. Study new ways of doing things, such as Israeli tomato hydroponics. Back when I was doing it, to produce a great deal of tomatoes per acre, or uh, the ability for a single man with the right machinery to process, to to harvest and maintain maybe a thousand acres of land which is enough to feed maybe 10,000 people. You can look at all sorts of ways to try to eliminate work instead of increasing it. In my view we need equity in the things that are needful to us through voluntary opt-in structures which will replace government. We eliminate taxation. We don't have policemen laying in wait for us everywhere to write tickets for us to pull us over. Um, we might have community helpers who uh, would fix your tail light if it was really that hazardous. Um, but why do we pay for people to harass us, except because we become intolerant of the way other people live? The higher aspirations of the individual, which I've divided uh, as follows, craftsmanship and art, to, for example, rebuild a strip mall into a work of architectural beauty with stained glass, tile floors, services, music, drama, to construct beautiful swimming pools, performance centers, rapid transit systems, bike paths. You know Americans don't walk. People in Europe do. That's why we're much fatter than they are, along with our corporate corn syrup-based diet for the poor. You pay more to eat healthily, quickly, than unhealthily. To research scientifically, to engineer. The Soviet Union and the East Bloc did many of these things, but they did it using force and many people died and were imprisoned, were put in mental hospitals uh, for being political dissidents. It was too heavy a price. Most people would rather have some degree of freedom, which we still have. We can still speak publicly, our minds, however it's been chilled, uh, than great universities uh, where people have difficulty expressing themselves. But I have met Eastern Europeans, a minority for sure, that really appreciated what they had in a few places, such as Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Socialism uses force. Cooperativism, if we will, is voluntary. We can take care of ourselves without very much government, but we must build such institutions. Ron Paul has not articulated a perfect vision. What he has articulated is a framework where people are not under compulsion, a framework that allows conservatives and liberals and leftists to each make their own decision as they see fit about how they want to live. We make things cheaper than people, uh, we make things cheaper than people can afford them, rather than um, uh, making a, a higher margin, because we're providing them for ourselves. Private businesses will then have to compete with these community enterprises, which in the past might not have been as efficient because they were small scale. There might be ways of leveraging international knowledge to help with these things. Computers mean that the inefficiencies of small business can be overcome. Software, the cloud. Because the customer is the owner. There are many variations on this theme. In other words, Ecotopia 
can thrive in a small government framework. Why have I not talked more of Ron Paul's specifics about economics? Because what I seek to do is show why I support Ron Paul, why my interests are best borne out through Paulism rather than Robomniism. What has Obama done for you? He killed, this is a bit of my own personal issue, he killed the founder of a, of a state, the state of Libya. Uh, which is Muammar Gaddafi, who threw off the shackles of colonialism and led the country to and became a dictator like Fidel Castro, although you know this is a somewhat of a, a brief uh, value judgment. We also have liquidated his leading ministers and took a well-educated police state and turned it into a chaotic land exporting Islamic extremism and allying with Al-Qaeda. You can find plenty of these stories. Just Google Al-Qaeda in Libya. My site shows Al-Qaeda flag flying over the place where the protests broke out in Benghazi on, if I'm not mistaken, February 17th. I hope the elections in Libya go well next month. I do not wish any Libyan ill. But what we did was not because we cared about the Libyans. And don't tell me it was Europe who did it. They couldn't have done it without us. They couldn't have done it without Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, and Barack Obama. They don't know yet how to invade and plunder the way we do. Obama's busting pot clinics, forcing people to buy pot from criminals instead of licensed regulated outlets against his own campaign promises. He failed to support decriminalization in Mexico, guaranteeing more bloodshed, more beheadings of children. If you bring a business out of the dark and into the light, violence goes down. Al Capone is what you get under prohibition, uh, and what you get now with a legal alcohol trade uh, is much preferable. He has accelerated the use of drones all over the world, which is a sinister, dark form of warfare that is terrifying if you're on the receiving side. He's part of an evil system, and you can tell by his face, if you ask me, that he's not under duress, that he enjoys it. Absolute power must feel pretty good. It must feel pretty good to be king, but it corrupts absolutely. There is evidence that power drives people mad to view everyone under them as there to serve them or adulate them. He passed the Patriot Act. He passed the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which allows us... Which, I'm happy to say, spent 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list earlier this year. However, the New York Times has... Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. New York Times, though, has refused to review it. However, they'll still impose Paul Krugman on us every week. That, we're not going to be spared. That, every week, we're definitely going to get him. But no, no dissent is allowed in the New York Times. But on the other hand, I think we all know about the financial picture the New York Times is facing. So I, I tend to think it doesn't want to promote a book that argues against bailouts, given what the media is obviously going to be demanding in the near future. Well, let's not talk about that particular depressing subject. And in fact, I don't... I hope I'm not going to depress you today, because I am going to leave you with the suggestion that there is a way out of this. Now, whether or not they're going to follow it is another question. But it's comforting to know that if we wanted to get out of this economic mess, we could do it. It's not impossible. It can be done. Now, I'm not going to talk about some of the things that you would likely encounter if you turned on right-wing radio, where you'd hear a lot of denunciation of the Community Reinvestment Act that introduced affirmative action in lending or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, whose irresponsible decisions were, I think, a, a fairly significant factor in all this. But all the same, there is nevertheless the elephant in the living room, the factor that more than any other contributed to the crisis, but yet that never gets mentioned, is never mentioned in a negative light, in, certainly in political circles, where in fact, to the contrary, we're in effect encouraged not even to think about it, and that's the Federal Reserve System. Now, most Americans hear Federal Reserve System and they think, I don't even know what this is. I'm never going to know. This is probably too complicated, and I better just let the experts take care of this. Well, that's the problem. The experts are a bunch of quacks. So it's important for us to learn this material, to know what's going on, so that we can have an informed opinion so that we won't inadvertently enlist in the army of drones who say that the solution to the crisis is to give more power to our wise overlords. Been there, done that. The Federal Reserve System is 
in effect in charge of the country's money supply, as I'm sure I don't need to tell people in this room. It has the ability to increase or decrease it. I think we all know the direction it normally goes. It is supposed to act as a lender of last resort for the financial sector. Well, there's one thing it knows how to do, right? We've seen that. That's no problem. They got that pretty well under control. And we're told that the Fed is a great stabilizing agent in the economy. So really, we shouldn't really be questioning it because the Fed brings scientific management to bear on our money supply. I mean, who could question that? What kind of crank are you, after all? You know, this is, this is for our own good. Even the left, which prides itself on its slogan, question authority, falls completely silent when it comes to the Fed. If you question the Fed, well, that's taking question authority just a little bit too far. Well, I intend to do that. I think those of us in this room are inclined not just to accept whatever we're fed by the establishment, especially when the establishment has been obviously so wrong. So we're inclined to ask fundamental questions that are normally passed over. So for example, normally what happens when there's an economic crisis of this kind is that we get people on one side saying we need fiscal stimulus, we've got to just blow a lot of borrowed money on nonsense projects and that'll make us rich. And then the other side is supposed to say, oh no, 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 let's just print up a lot of money and spend it on such, such and such. And that's the big debate. That's the debate. But yet we are introducing into this debate a third possibility, which is that the first two are completely juvenile and are only going to make the situation worse. Now what I'm going to be talking to you about today, though, involves something called the Austrian School of Economics. This has nothing to do with Austria per se, other than a lot of the, uh, the early figures in the school came from Austria. Now this is important because right now the Austrian School, which is a school of economic thought, is the smallest probably in the world. It also happens to be the oldest continuously existing school of thought in the world, and right now it's the fastest growing. Why? Because disproportionately, economists of the Austrian school predicted what we're seeing at a time when the rest of the profession was completely blindsided. James Galbraith estimates that maybe one-tenth or one one-hundredth of a percent of professional economists saw this crisis coming. Now, naturally, he's not including the Austrian economists, because that's the job of James Galbraith, to pretend there are no Austrian economists. But we need, to, we need to highlight these people, because they did see what's coming, and that's why people are interested in them. Meanwhile, the mainstream, so-called, of the economics profession has, in my opinion, completely disgraced itself during this crisis. Not only because it failed to see it coming, not only because they told us this is the most robust economy anyone's ever seen, they said that in 2007, but also because the solutions, so-called solutions, they propose, as I say, are utterly juvenile and extremely crude. And this is all they have to show for themselves. Now, the mainstream of the economics profession has, in